the world of uh, non-microbial parasites. This is kind of divided into regular parasites and ectoparasites. And so we'll cover more or less what that means. But um, the idea here is that even though these guys are fairly large, they're fairly large uh, observable organisms more than anything else, they're included under our field, one, because they cause disease, but also simply because they, um, at some point in time in their lifetime, they happen to have a microscopic stage where whether it's the reproductive stage, the feeding stage, something about them that was tiny enough that needed a microscope, right? And so I'm gonna give you just a brief kind of very, very kind of short story of what your parasites are, right? And so believe it or not, the field of parasitology has its own definitions and it's not similar, it's similar enough to what people understand but there are some qualifications. So very similar to what we're gonna talk about during epidemiology a little bit more. So for us, our parasites, if you're trying to in, uh, define them a little bit further, these are things that definitely have to survive in or on you, very similar to your microbiome. And they must feed and develop uh, or grow, in this case, inside of you, on you, around you, that kind of thing, at your expense. And so that means that there has to be a negative consequence to this. So it's not just it's living on you without causing harm. That's your microbiome. This is living on you and causing you harm. Okay. Um, and the reason why this field is much bigger than usual is simply because of their uh, medical impact. And more than anything else, their socioeconomical impact, simply because these are in the billions of people being infected typically. Right. So um, one of the few terms that we're gonna introduce here that definitely you should be familiar with um, is the difference between what we call a definitive host and an inter intermediate host. And the differences here lie between you know, who starts and who ends. A lot of these organisms go through several different hosts just to get to the final one, right? The idea here is that uh, something they go through, a, a rat, a mouse, uh, a chicken, or something like that before it gets onto you. And so all of those guys that it's running through for reproduction, for development, for whatever it is, those are referred to as intermediate hosts. And then usually in its final stage of growth, whichever one that may be, because they do change a little bit, that's what we will call the definitive host. That's the last person that they hit, or organism, I shouldn't say person, um, and usually that's kind of where they get it on and produce more copies of themselves. That's kind of our definitive host. And I'll start giving you examples as we go. Now, before we visit this further in epidemiology, uh, there are stages and more than anything else, there are key entry points that we define, right? And so here, uh, your parasites can gain access. Probably the most easiest way to do so um, is by ingestion, by you consuming it, you know, by you eating it or swallowing it if you're drinking it because water counts there. Or the other common form for this is for some sort of uh, vector to transmit this onto you, some sort of uh, carrier, if you will, to do that. And then other ways involve some sort of contact put directly with your skin or part of your body that allows them to get in. And that can be uh, more or less all the dry parts, like I said, like your skin, hair, that kind of thing, or all your wet parts. And so that means your uh, epithelial ish, uh, tissues. So anything from your ears, eyes, nose, uh, genitalia, that kind of thing, all of them kind of fit into that category too, right? So that being said, let's get on to the good stuff. So first of all, we're gonna deal with what most of you uh, would consider uh, worms, right? And so it, you're kind of right in terms of kind of that they're wiggly and kind of stringy kind of looking, but they do have uh, some degrees of classification that you should know and you should be able to report, all right? So let's get into the first set. Now, first of all, they fall under this taxonomy or taxon of invertebrates, meaning they don't have any skeletons, right? And even though they're under the regular kingdom that all of you are familiar with, which are your animals, uh, like I said, these are invertebrate organisms and under um, their current phylum, the phylum, phyla, I'm sorry, that we're gonna be observing are phyla platyhelminthes, 
and a brand new updated phylum, which is going to be phylum nematoda. Now, what has happened here is that nematoda used to be a class, believe it or not, and um, there used to be uh, an old category out there that's called ASCII helminthes. And that one no longer exists. That one has been kind of dissolved. So you may still see it in your textbook and you may see it kind of floating around elsewhere. But uh, those kind of have been dissolved and reclassified into something a little bit more useful. So the two phyla we're gonna focus on are phylum uh, platyhelminthes and phylum nematoda. That's the plan. And under there, there's gonna be several different classes that you should definitely know. So under the flatworms that you'll hear, which are the platyhelminthes, You'll hear about the trematodes, cestodes, and turbellarians, which are the ones we're interested in. And then under the nematodes, there's been a brand new group that is still about to pop up called the Adenophorea, but we're gonna be uh, interested in the Cesarnintia. So those are the ones we're interested in playing with. All right, so let's kind of go on with this stuff. So let's enter the main uh, full field of flatworms, the platyhelminthes. The term helminth usually is used as a term to kind of relate to uh, worms themselves. And then the platy part here is the key term that's saying that they're usually flat. That's where that guy's coming from, right? That's where we wanna proceed at least for now. And so for our flatworms, um, these are fairly macroscopic. So yes, you can visualize them, you can see them. Um, they're all eukaryotes, you're all, uh, multicellular. So again, these are definitely organisms you can see anywhere, right? And so what they require most of the time is they definitely have some sort of intermediate host somewhere in there so that they can uh, grow their young, if you will. That's called that larval stage that I'm mentioning in there. And then ultimately, um, once they find enough growth, growth, they make it through their teenage years, if you will, then they move on, on to you or whatever its definitive host is gonna be. Now you'll notice that I'm mentioning a term here is that they could be what we call dioecious or monoecious, and this is a terminology that you should be familiar with simply because it kind of explains their reproduction cycles just a little bit or just enough for us to be uh, critical for their understanding. And so dioecious, uh, what it means, the term di here meaning two, is that it has two separate individuals representing what is equivalent to a male and female not necessarily always the same, our definitions are very different than what they are, but it's like saying two separate type of organisms that kind of represent counterparts of a reproductive cycle. That's really what it means, okay? It's not that there's males and females, even though we do use that terminology every now and then, okay? And if it's uh, monoecious, on the other hand, that means that both uh, uh, male and female reproductive system counterparts are present in the same organism. So the term mono here meaning one. So dioecious representing here two organisms or monoecious representing one organism with both parts, if you will, okay? Now, um, as we're gonna try and look at through what's interested for us or interesting for us at least, is this concept of uh, which type of worms are kind of fun to kind of observe. And so let's kind of begin with the cestodes and the trematodes, which are gonna be the more entertaining ones of them all and we'll see how far we can get. So let's go with the tapeworms. Those are probably the most obvious of them all, right? So let's kind of go with the basics really fast, right? I'm sure you've at least heard about what tapeworm is, right? Um, and kind of roughly what they look, they're fairly flat, hence the term platyhelminthes, that should be an obvious stage there. But they're composed of a bunch of repetitive little pieces. And so they look like little uh, boxes, one after another. And so each one of those technically is capable of reproducing and making more copies of itself. Now, what's unique about these guys is again, they can grow extremely long. And I'm not saying, oh, they can be five feet long. They can be 20, 30 feet long. So they're fairly long in this case, in terms of their size. Now, where they do that is the fun part. Um, they're able to do this when they're inside of you, you as the definitive host, um, and certain other organisms, there's tapeworms for you know, horses and cows and pigs and dogs and things like that too, right? But in this case, 
uh, they grow this length while they're inside of you. So they're basically intestinal parasites, that's where they survive. Um, and they have this kind of separation of little pieces, which is what we're gonna kind of describe in a moment, uh, that are called proglottids. So each little chunk that you're seeing there highlighted is one little piece that contains, uh, it's a, basically a body segment that contains both male and female counterparts in there, so the testes and the ovaries. Um, however, it's not auto-fertilizable. So allow me to kind of clarify that, let me show you a little bit more behind this, is that even though it does possess both male and female counterparts within the same proglottid, it is not auto-fertilizable. So the eggs and sperm technically that it's producing do not fertilize themselves there. Instead, the sperm, or the equivalent of the sperm that they produce, leaves that one proglottid and travels to another one nearby. And so they are here to provide a tiny little bit of variation and also kind of prevent uh, this kind of auto-fertilization uh, key feature of becoming pregnant out of nowhere. And so the collection of this long, long chain of proglottids uh, are referred to as strobola. And usually most of the ones that are surviving on you kind of absorbing the food from their skin while they're inside of you, or inside your intestines or anything else, are referred to as immature. They're just kind of eating more than anything else. But once they're ready to reproduce and they start kind of uh, fertilizing them, uh, the other proglottids, they become what we call gravid, another term, believe it or not, that we still also use in humans called pregnant. The term here is called gravid. Now, the fun part behind this is uh, the head, if you will, the top portion of it that has a fancy little name called a scolex. And we actually use that scolex as a way to classify them and define them and figure out what version of them are they. Now, even though it looks like it has a mouth, and we'll talk about it in a second, they don't really have a mouth. Remember, they absorb nutrients on their skin, so they don't really need a mouth but it does kind of look like it. So kind of it's one of those things that people kind of uh, just assume. No, they're not around, they're chewing on you. Instead, they're just kind of ingesting you by, uh, via absorption, if you will. But on that scolex, what that little head tip is important for is for attachment. So on that head, on that scolex, it usually has these little hooks sticking out to them or some sort of ventral sucker kind of thing in which it kind of um, sucks onto or attaches onto your intestinal wall and that way it won't fall off. In other words, you won't pass it through your feces. That's the key feature there. And so we'll show you a few of these examples also, especially in the lab, right? So um, what's the big deal behind these guys? Um, the cycle, which is kind of important for you to know, understand the basics behind them, right? Um, <clears throat> What usually happens is that as the proglottids become gravid, so pregnant, and they start producing eggs, those eggs start being released into the feces. So that means you pass those. And so what will happen is ultimately they'll gain access to the outside. Now, what's the big deal behind that? Even though it might seem too crazy, you have a bathroom, a toilet, or something like that in which your feces go to. So that prevents a lot of that issue. But usually if you're out in the woods, that can disappear disappears, or if you work in farmland, which may not be accessible all the time, or especially if you're in contact with animals, feces more than anything else. So for those people that work with uh, our animals, our food as well, that means they can be clo in close contact. And so being in contact with those brings them close to hatched larvae. So those eggs that land in the feces are out there floating in the world, eventually hatch, turn into babies, if you will, and they'll start um, uh, growing, developing, reaching their cool little teenage years, if you will. And they reach a stage called a cysticercus, or plural, cysticerci. And what happens is those kind of uh, younglings, if you will, um, are the things we normally consume. So the ones that are barely starting to move, barely starting to grow, that's what we normally consume, usually because they kind of get trapped inside the tissue of the intermediate host. See, they're not kind of going around chasing you. Instead, they kind of hatch, they grow a little bit, and as they're trying to get to the intestine of the intermediate host, they kind of get stuck somewhere, usually in some sort of muscle. And at that point in time, 
They just kind of stay there. And then when you consume that food, what usually is what we consume are muscle. Um, so any animal that we end up consuming most of the time, we consume their muscle. That's where they're trapped. And so once that uh, gets consumed, it, that little uh, circus develops into a full-blown head, a scolex. And that little scolex then starts kind of seeking out your intestine until it finds a safe little place, attaches itself in there, and then begins to grow proglottids. And so those proglottids are the ones that eventually get longer and longer and longer and then repeat the cycle. Now, in case you're kind of wondering, that's what the uh, little scolex looks like versus a proglottid up close. Um, the one that you're seeing here is the bunny one. Uh, it's called Tinea pisiformis, uh, what grows in bunnies. So yes, bunnies get tapeworms too. But uh, there's various different versions that I'm listing up there from uh, the ones that grow on pigs, on cattle, and including humans. Those are the ones we usually share. And there are definitely ones that uh, even your dogs get, um, even though they get a slightly different name. Right? But what you're seeing on the left-hand side is that scolex. Uh, you can see the little ventral suckers up there. Those are the uh, kind of methods of attachment. I'm trying to see if I can do this. There it goes. So these little kind of oval discs, those are forms of attachment. And also kind of at the edge of it, you actually see these kind of little hair-like follicles that are of little hooks. So basically this entire apparatus is used as a way of attachment so that you don't pass it through your feces. Now, once it attaches, then it starts growing these guys, these sort of proglottids. And what you'll see are the female and male portions that you're seeing kind of that look like little veins. And then those little branches that you're seeing there are the equivalent of the ovaries. And so once uh, these guys uh, start secreting sperm from other uh, proglottids, they land there, these proglottids become gravid, pregnant, and then start releasing the eggs, fertilized eggs, I'm sorry, into the stool. And so this is what people pass and usually ends up being transmitted to somebody else. Now, every now and then you do pass a couple of the proglottids as it starts getting longer, they fall off or they break off. Um, so you end up getting a few of those per day in your kind of daily routine. But now out of kind of the more interesting portion is how do you get it and where do you get it and why, when kind of interesting stuff. Um, believe it or not, you find these guys everywhere. It's fairly well distributed. Um, there's no place on the planet that we don't find uh, tapeworms. Uh, it's commonly associated with just the consumption of beef and pork. Those are our basics, right? but it's fairly common in more uh, socioeconomical challenged places. So your rural areas, your not so clean places, the places that have poor access to good water or sewage, that kind of thing, um, in more or less poor areas, right? And even though it's relatively rare in the United States, it's still fairly prominent. Um, now what's really cool about this, in case you wanna know, most of these tapeworms end up being somewhere between 1,000 to 2,000 per lot, it's long. And now uh, I'll show you these in the images for the lab, but you'll see that each proglottid, proglottid, I'm sorry, is quite visible. So you don't really need a microscope to see them. So they're tiny, yes, you may need to squint a little bit, but you can see one proglottid. Now to see inside of it, definitely a scope. But you can visually kind of acknowledge what a little proglottid looks like. And if this guy grows to be a thousand to two thousand of those, um, you can definitely see this more. And what's crazy about this is that each of those proglottids can produce anywhere between 50 to 100,000 eggs, each one of them. So you can do the math in there. Now, once you start passing them through your feces, usually the easiest way to kind of figure out what you have um, is by differentiating the scolex. So that head uh, portion that we were talking about before, that's how we usually tell which version of a tapeworm it is. Now, thankfully, uh, we have lots of good anti-helminthic drugs, so anti-worm drugs, if you will. Um, and so the most common ones that are currently used out there, these are the ones that are approved by the CDC and the World Health Organization, uh, are praziquantel and uh, albendazole. Um, I'm going to highlight albendazole simply because it falls under a group of sulfur-based compounds called azoles. And you see that at the end of that term right there. And so those are fairly useful in lots of anti-protist as well as anti-helminthic treatments. So you'll see this drug kind of pop up or its name vary a little bit, but you'll hear it uh, end in azole a lot. So you'll uh, hear about this drug quite often. All right, so that's one group that we're interested in. 
Now we're going to enter the second group under class Trematoda. Again, still our flatworms, still um, phylum Vladihelminthes, except that now we've entered a brand new class called the Trematodes. Well, the class is Trematoda, we call them the Trematodes. That's really, and so they're often referred to as just flukes. That's the name that you'll hear them used by. Now here, rather than being a very, very long version of it, instead, it looks like one little divot. Uh, more often, they kind of look like these kind of extended ovalish type of um, leaf-like shapes, right? And so um, what you end up seeing is that the whole organism is built within that one uh, little piece or segment, if you will. Now, what's crazy about this one is that now they do have a mouth. However, they do not have, have an anus which means that they don't have a complete portion of digestion in here, meaning that there's no entry and exit point. There's only an entry, which means the most obvious part that you should probably be able to deduce is that in order for it to produce its waste, it will vomit it back up. And that's kind of where it also gets a little bit more dangerous in the fact that what it's kind of uh, eating, processing, absorbing, Eventually, it vomits back onto you, and it can be a real little toxic here and there. So it eats it, and it vomits it back onto you. Now, that same mouth um, also acts as a sucker, too. That's what it uses to attach itself to uh, the definitive host and then kind of suck uh, the uh, nutrients into its awesome little digestive system or semi-digestive system until it uses what it needs and then vomits it back uh, out. Now, how do we get this bad boy? This one's commonly associated with swimming. This guy is kind of a swimmer, if you will. And so what will happen is, again, this is usually isolated from feces. And so uh, this guy, you find it close to wa uh, bodies of water, again, if you wanted to go swim a little bit later, right? And so um, the swimming version of these guys, once they're born, the baby versions of them are called a miracidium or miracidia, depending on which one, uh, plural or singular. And so after about a day or so of having kind of hatched, those little swimmers will usually look for their key intermediate host, which is usually snails. Um, they happen to kind of like to ride these guys for some reason. They make really good carriers um, for them to kind of grow and then kind of uh, develop a lot, a few little uh, reproductive cycles to make more of themselves. And then eventually they'll go into the teenager stage and then kind of this kind of young adult version called a cercaria, also known as a metacercaria eventually. Um, and so those little cercaria will actively start seeking out the definitive host, which is you, humans. Now every now and then there can have a secondary intermediate host. And so what happens is those little snails um, or the mirosidium themselves can be consumed by fish, right? And so we are the ones that consume those fish and that's how we get it as well. So there's kind of a small variation. Um, so either of these little teenage young adult versions of them can enter your skin directly or you swallow them or drink them um, by consuming contaminated pieces close to bodies of water or some of them make into the fish kind of get stuck in there just like we saw in the tapeworm and then we consume the muscle of that fish and then they hatch inside of us and they turn into this last stage called a metacercaria, uh, plural or metacercaria uh, singular. At that point in time, same idea, attaches to it, you, grows, and then you pass it eventually through your feces and continue the cycle, right? Now, what's so unique or fun about these guys? Um, we'll talk about a couple of them uh, to discuss, but the, under the trematodes, there's two big ones that we talk about, which are the fasciola groups and the schistosoma groups, um, both flukes, obviously. Um, they're known as liver flukes and blood flukes, and we'll take a few of them, uh, look at a few of them in the lab. But um, it just so happens that, for example, the liver fluke versions of them, um, we happen to be an accident. We, don't, we are not definitely the, uh, the final host or definitive host, if you will. But every now and then, simply because we consume certain vegetables, uh, certain plants more than anything, certain grasses more specifically, um, that the mericidium happens to be uh, hanging in there, the cercaria, sorry, happens to be hanging in there and we consume those, then it enters our body, and then they kind of hatch inside our intestines. So this is another reason why not to go vegan, just saying. Um, and then we have our blood flukes, which um, lead to something under a disease called schistosomiasis, 
which in case you've heard it somewhere else, it might've been called snail fever, as you can understand why the intermediate hosts are related in there. And this is where the danger really begins because um, this is per year, we get about 200 million cases. So a fifth of a billion, I want you to just kind of start thinking of the scale of how many people get hit by this. Um, and so remember we're currently at close to 8 billion. Um, and so one fifth of a billion is quite a bit of our population dying. And so usually about those many cases, they get really sick. Most of them recover, but we usually get about a 20,000 cases per uh, death uh, cases per year behind those. So it's a pretty good number too. So now there is a little bit of a side story associated with this guy in which again, they travel, they swim, they get inside of you or you consume them. But every now and then sometimes uh, when they're developing, those eggs don't quite hatch. They get, kind of get stuck. And so what happens to those eggs is that they calcify. So they harden, they turn into little rocks, if you will. So kind of like the same concept of a kidney stone, if you will, this over calcification of this tissue, gets trapped and does not move. And so what ends up doing that, uh, doing to our tissue is that it kills it. It starts uh, preventing access to nutrients, preventing access to blood vessels, that kind of thing. And so you end up necrotizing the tissue as well. So not only does it kind of feed off you, feed off of you as a parasite, there's a small option in there in which it can go a little wrong, get stuck inside of you and also kill you. And so it will kill like pieces of your legs, which is one of the more common versions of them, uh, pieces of your biceps kind of thing. And then, and, and then under very extreme uh, rarity, it can make it to the heart and cause heart attacks. So again, that's extremely rare, mind you. Okay, so don't be worried about these guys giving heart attacks out of nowhere. Um, and so the way we figure these guys out is usually also looking at feces or urine. We can figure out the eggs themselves. That's how we diagnose them. And then we have pretty really good treatments, uh, anti-helminthic treatments for these guys using that same drug we mentioned for the tapeworms, which are called praziquantel. So there are good ways to treat them. Now to kind of show you a little bit of pretty stories behind these guys, um, these are the liver flukes ones. These are the ones we kind of happen to be accidental. Um, hosts and so they look like kind of this leafy body this kind of ovalish body that you're seeing over there and you can see the little sucker uh, portion that kind of attaches itself to the tissues and uh, that they damage anything from intestines to your liver more than anything else and kind of wanted to kind of give you this idea of scale these ones you can see so this is not microscopic those are two size so uh, fasciola or fasciolopsis which is the one that you're seeing on the right hand side, uh, which we'll see also shortly in the lab. These are an inch long. So you can actually see them clear as day. And so it's only during their kind of egg and circarial stage that you kind of get kind of, my, kind of uh, microscopic. So these are fairly observable, fairly easy to kind of detect. And so we'll show you some images in a moment. Now, the one we were mentioning a little bit more is uh, schistosoma, which is our blood fluke. And so here, what's unique about this guy is that we do, it's definitely dioecious, so that means it has kind of what we refer to as a male and female uh, counterpart. And so what you'll notice though is that one is relatively larger than the other, right? And what's also unique during the uh, reproductive stage is that one, will kind of uh, absorb it into this little kind of pouch, it kind of folds around it, in which it will receive the other one, and then reproduction can begin. Now, what this kind of boils down to first is that the female is the larger of the two, and the male is the one that gets cuddled. So at least, you know, while they're inside of you, they're cuddling, and the, that's actually something to say for the fun that they're having inside of you, right? All right, so we, uh, stop from here and we're going to enter what we call the free living flatworms and we'll go into more details uh, probably into more entertaining one uh, personally simply because we're one of the most unique or organisms and so under this group this is class turbellaria and there's only one reason why we look at these guys is that they're a unique feature this is kind of the happy story of today um, in which you know, this particular class happens to be kind of cool looking. These are the guys that are kind of what you're seeing on the top right hand side. Uh, they look like they have these kind of little tipped heads with little eyeballs 
almost which they are eyes, believe it or not. Um, and they're very symmetrical. Now, uh, the common term that you'll hear from here is they're usually referred to as planarians. That's kind of what the field usually um, refers to them. And what's really cool about them is that they're extremely sensitive. And what I mean by this is that anytime you see these guys present, which are also fairly observable, they get a couple of inches long, is that you'll know that whatever water they're present is extremely clean. Um, they're very sensitive to any type of pollution or any type of uh, substance present in the, in the waters that they usually swim in. And so any type of contaminant, they usually die off very fast. So if you happen to see these guys in water, believe it or not, that water is probably very drinkable. So um, kind of hard to find for these guys, but you can actually conclude that from them. Now, what's really unique about these guys, the reason why we're kind of bringing it up for our topic is because of what they can do. And so I'm pretty sure from stories that you've seen from things like uh, some lizards to some starfish in which they can regrow limbs, these guys, they can regrow everything. And to the point that even though as sad as this may sound, uh, scientists have kind of taken our little planarians, our little turbolarians uh, that you're seeing here, in which they'll chop them literally in half, you know, leave like a tail portion and a head portion, and then the tail portion will regrow a head, and then the tail uh, head portion will grow a tail. I'm like, all right, that's pretty neat. But then people will slice them in the other direction, uh, kind of symmetrically in half. And then the left side will grow a right side and the right side will grow a left side. Again, pretty impressive. Um, but to the point that people got a little sadistic and decided to chop it up into a million little pieces and every single one of those pieces will grow into a brand new individual. So it's a very amazing adaptation of these organisms that they can regrow virtually everything. And so that's where really the research comes into play of what is it that these organisms have that allow them to do so. What's so unique about their cells in which they can actually regrow more of themselves quickly, efficiently, without a lot of damage. So again, a really, really kind of unique feature of these flatworms, at least for um, our research purposes and kind of curiosity more than anything else. 